The cinema of the nation of Italy has been one of the most important and influential in the world since the early days of film. Italy has given the world several of the most acclaimed directors and won more Oscars for Best Foreign Film than any other nation. Italian filmmakers have had success in many different genres and modes, including art house, horror, comedy, and western. Italian films were quite successful during this silent era. They produced a variety of genres, but the rest of the world mostly associated them with epics. These were historical films that usually took place in classical times, with some occasionally set in the Middle Ages or later. They were known for their extravagant sets and massive crowds of extras. A key director in this genre was Giovanni Pastrone, who none other than Martin Scorsese credits with inventing the epic genre. His 30-minute-long 1911 film The Fall of Troy told the story of the Trojan War using over 800 actors. It was very successful and led to Italy making more expensive and ambitious movies. Pastrone's feature film Cabiria was one of the biggest and came out three years later. Cabiria had even bigger sets and thousands of extras and was set during ancient times as well. It took place during the Second Punic War that pitted Rome against Carthage, and features spectacles such as a volcano erupting, and used real elephants when depicting the crossing of the Alps by Carthaginian General Hannibal. The cinematography is highly seminal in Cabiria through its use of a moving camera, and it is credited as the first film to use a dolly for tracking shots. Cabiria also introduced the strongman Machiste character that would go on to star in a series of films that lasted until the 1920s. Both Cabiria and another hit epic, Quo Vadis, helped make the epic genre an international phenomenon. Quo Vadis was based on the famous Henrik Sienkiewicz novel of the same name that takes place during the reign of Roman Emperor Nero. It too had thousands of extras, and its two-hour runtime was quite long for the era. Other important silent epics include Julius Caesar and The Last Days of Pompeii. Italy also made contributions to the nascent avant-garde film scene. The decade of the 1910s saw the rise of a new visual art movement in Italy called Futurism, which celebrated modernity over tradition, and its painting, sculptures, and other art forms portrayed speed, movement, and technology. Several futurist films were made in this era, but sadly only one, titled Thais from 1917, even partially survives. The film is most notable for the use of abstract, unrealistic sets that prefigured the German Expressionist movement of the following decade. The post-World War I era was one of decline for the Italian film industry, which lasted into the 1920s. Mussolini taking over in 1922 and strict censorship from the fascists didn't help matters. There were still a few filmmakers making quality work, such as Alessandro Blasetti and Mario Camerini. The most popular genre of Italian film in the 1930s were romances known as Telefone Bianchi, or White Telephone, named after a style of telephone that was indicative of wealth. These movies were infused with fascist ideology, as they were socially conservative, and encouraged respect for authority and existing class hierarchies. A precursor to the genre is The Song of Love, which was actually the first Italian sound picture. Often regarded as the best example of a white telephone film, is Everybody's Woman, from German director Max Ophels. Italy's greatest contribution to cinema came in the 1940s and 50s with the neorealism movement. I actually already made a video entirely devoted to neorealism, so I'll just briefly summarize it here, and you can check that out if you want to learn more. Neorealism was heavily impacted by the conditions of post-World War II Italy, and the general disillusionment about the world among Italians caused by fascism. The movement had a monumental influence on cinema, with two specific examples being shooting on location as opposed to in studios, and the use of first-time untrained actors. Neorealist films also had a cynical outlook on life, and often focused on the working class or other marginalized members of society. They often had episodic structure, and ambiguous or unsatisfying endings. The main films to start with are Roberto Rossellini's Rome Open City, Luchino Visconti's Ossessione, along with Bicycle Thieves and Umberto D from Vittorio De Sica. Neorealism also saw the start of the career of likely the most renowned Italian director, Federico Fellini. He worked with Rossellini as a scriptwriter multiple times, 
and his early films as a director of the 1950s are often associated with neorealism. His 1953 film, E. Vitaloni, is often described as being at least neorealist adjacent. It was filmed on location, but did have a cast of experienced actors, and was his international breakthrough. A great place to dive into Fellini is his next feature, La Strada, which won the first ever Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film. Another essential early Fellini is the episodic La Dolce Vita, which won the top prize at Cannes and even got Fellini an Oscar directing nomination, something quite rare, especially at the time, for a non-English language movie. Fellini was known for making very personal films, and there's no better example than Oscar winner Eight and a Half, a metafictional tale of an Italian film director and his anxieties. It was also Fellini's first to focus heavily on dreams and fantasy, topics that would become hallmarks of his in his later career. After Eight and a Half, Fellini's films would become increasingly surreal, with later films including Satyricon, Roma, and Amarcord. Another titan of the art house world who started out on neorealist films is Michelangelo Antonioni. His directing career began around the same time, but his fame came a bit later. While Fellini is relatively accessible for art house cinema, Antonioni's work was much more divisive. Influenced by neorealism, his films were de-dramatized and often focused on mundane events. His best-known Italian movies are a loose thematic trilogy made up of La Ventura, La Notte, and Le Clisse. They examine the alienation of modern society and portray detached characters that are lifeless, emotionless, and have difficulty communicating with others. They are slow films with long silences, and like many neorealist works, have unsatisfying open endings. Antonioni also had masterful cinematography in his films, with lots of long takes, camera movement, and deep focus. In the mid-60s, he started making English-language films, like the Palm d'Or winning Blow Up and Zabriskie Point, a financial failure with a soundtrack that included bands like Pink Floyd and The Grateful Dead. In the late 1950s, a new style emerged that was later dubbed Commedia all'Italiana, which literally means Italian-style comedies, but refers to comedic movies made there from around 1958 to the late 70s. It started with the highly popular heist film Big Deal on Madonna Street, directed by Mario Monicelli, who'd end up being a mainstay of the genre. It also helped launch the career of Marcello Mastroianni, who would go on to be one of the biggest Italian actors and star in films by Fellini and Antonioni. Other important Monicelli films include The Great War and The Organizer. The genre got its name from Pietro Jeremy's dark comedy Divorce Italian Style, which won the Best Original Screenplay Oscar and got Mastroianni a Best Actor nomination. While comedic, these films didn't shy away from harsh satire or unhappy endings, as seen in Dino Risi's commercial and critical success, The Overtaking. Neorealist icon Vittorio De Sica made his mark on the genre, with two collaborations with the most famous Italian actress of all time, Sophia Loren. These were Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow, and Marriage Italian Style. De Sica also directed Loren in her lead actress Oscar-winning role in Two Women, making her the first actor to win an Oscar for a non-English language performance. Lina Wertmüller worked in the genre in the 60s, but became more well-known internationally in the 70s with films like the highly political The Seduction of Mimi. For Seven Beauties, she became the first woman to be nominated for Best Director at the Oscars. Also in the late 50s, we get the beginnings of a genre known as peplum, which is also sometimes termed sword and sandal. These movies were usually set in classical antiquity or based on mythology, but rarely stayed true to either history or myth. The film that started the craze and is the best place to start with the genre is Hercules, which was lampooned on the TV show Mystery Science Theater 3000, if that gives you any indication as to its quality. Despite wooden performances and cheesy dialogue, it's certainly not without a certain charm and was a big financial success. Like many Peplum films, it starred an American, with the title character played by Steve Reeves, a bodybuilder with minimal prior acting experience. Hercules and many other Peplum protagonists were inspired by the strongman machiste characters in the silent period. Peplum was one of many trends that would gain popularity in the Italian film industry and then quickly die out. 
Some directors that will come up later in this video that made Peplum movies are Sergio Leone and Mario Bava. The late 1950s and early 60s also saw Italy finally getting into the horror genre. The first since the silent era came in 1957 with Lust of the Vampire, and the director of photography was Mario Bava, son of Eugenio Bava, who worked as a cinematographer on silence like Quo Vadis and Kabiria. Mario was the cinematographer of dozens of films, including Hercules and Hercules Unchained, before directing classics like Black Sunday, Black Sabbath, and Blood and Black Lace. In 1971, he made A Bay of Blood, a violent precursor to the slasher genre. Bava's films didn't make a lot of money, but got a cult following that has lasted to the current day. In 1961, controversial director Pier Paolo Pasolini directed his first feature. He made several adaptations of religious and mythological texts throughout the 60s and early 70s, like The Gospel According to Matthew, Oedipus Rex, The Canterbury Tales, and The Decameron, written by the 14th century Italian Giovanni Boccaccio. But he's most remembered today for his final film Salo, which is considered by some to be the most disturbing film ever made, and his brutal murder in 1975. On to the mid-60s, we get the beginnings of spaghetti westerns. Like with neorealism, this genre is such a big topic that I made a video solely about spaghetti westerns, and I'll just give you the basics here. The term spaghetti western refers to movies in the western genre made by Italian filmmakers in the 1960s and 70s that often utilize the same stylistic devices and plot tropes. They were known for their amazing music and stylized cinematography, and these films featured cynical antiheroes and were often more violent and morally gray than a traditional western. They were inspired by classic westerns, and the Italian directors clearly had lots of respect for their predecessors, but they took the genre in a new direction. Like with Peplum movies, American actors often appeared, with the most prominent one being Clint Eastwood. The obvious starting point with spaghetti westerns are the three films he made with legendary director Sergio Leone, collectively known as the Dollars or Man with No Name trilogy. A Fistful of Dollars, A Few Dollars More, and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly introduced many features that would become genre cliches, like a cynical, unshaven protagonist, heavy use of zooms, and bold, colorful opening credit sequences. And all three had excellent scores by composer Ennio Morricone, whose sound became inextricably associated with the genre. The Dollars Trilogy and his two other westerns, Once Upon a Time in the West and Duck You Sucker, combine art and entertainment to appeal to both cinephiles and mainstream movie fans. After that, you should check out the films of Sergio Corbucci, especially Django, starring genre mainstay Franco Nero as a taciturn gunslinger that bears a strong resemblance to Eastwood's character. Other key Corbucci westerns include The Mercenary, The Great Silence, and Compañeros. As spaghetti westerns were fading away, many of the cast and crew who worked on them were moving on to a new genre that would eventually be called poliziotesky, or Eurocrime. Like spaghetti westerns, they were violent, highly stylized, and influenced by American movies. In this case, it was cop films like The French Connection and Dirty Harry, and mob movies like The Godfather. The genre was also a reaction to unrest, political violence, and terrorism that plagued Italy in the 60s and 70s. The protagonists were frequently tough, angry cops that had to go outside the system to achieve results, and spaghetti western star Franco Nero often played them. In the 1960s and 70s, a similar genre was developing referred to as Eurowar, but also sometimes as macaroni combat, as a play on the term spaghetti western. American war films were quite successful in the 1960s, such as The Dirty Dozen, The Longest Day, The Guns of Navarone, and Battle of the Bulge. These were all set in World War II, so of course the Italians followed suit, and most Euro War films took place then, especially before the 1980s. An entertaining one for genre newcomers is The Inglorious Bastards from 1978, which is of course now more famous for having the same name as a Quentin Tarantino movie. In this period, Italy was also still making contributions to more serious cinema as well. For example, controversial art house director and Pasolini protege Bernardo Bertolucci had his breakthrough in 1970 with The Conformist, and became the first Italian to win Best Director at the Academy Awards for The Last Emperor. 
The 70s and 80s were huge for Italy in the genres of horror and exploitation. The big name for horror in this era was Dario Argento, and his most watched work is Suspiria from 1977, which is appreciated for its striking use of color and progressive rock soundtrack, among other aspects. After that, other Argento films to watch include Deep Red and The Bird with the Crystal Plumage. Another major horror director of the era was Lucio Fulci. While he had been directing since the late 50s, he's remembered for his later films once he turned to horror. Two big ones are Zombie 2 and The Beyond, and zombies were a subgenre that did decently well in Italy. Around this time, there was also a cannibal movie trend, known for overly shocking and violent films like the infamous Cannibal Holocaust. Italy put out many cult classic exploitation films in the 70s and 80s, like the horror movies of Joe D'Amato, including Anthropophagus and Absurd. While the 1980s was not kind to the Italian film industry, there were still talented filmmakers starting their careers, like Nanni Moretti, who also writes and stars in his often autobiographical films. Moretti is left-wing, and politics show up a lot in his work, especially Silvio Berlusconi, an Italian prime minister who served on and off from 1994 to 2011, and was eventually convicted of tax fraud. Moretti won the Palm d'Or in 2001, with his drama about grief titled The Sun's Room. Another director who began making films in the 80s is Giuseppe Tornatore, whose 1988 period piece Cinema Paradiso won the Best Foreign Language Oscar and the Second Place Grand Prix at Cannes. In 1997, easily one of the most well-known Italian films outside of Italy was released, and that's Life is Beautiful, directed by and starring Roberto Benigni, and set during World War II. Life is Beautiful made $230 million worldwide, with $57 million of that coming in the U.S., making it by far the highest-grossing non-English film in the U.S. at the time. Even to this day, only Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon has surpassed it. It also won three Oscars, including Best Actor for Benini, who also got a directing nomination. In the 21st century, Italy has still been going strong, with many new internationally significant directors making quality work. Among the most acclaimed is Paolo Sorrentino, whose 2013 drama The Great Beauty won the Best Foreign Language Oscar and BAFTA. Sorrentino also includes politics in his work at times, like with Loro, a 2018 satire about Berlusconi. Matteo Garone has made crime dramas like the Grand Prix winning Gamora and Dogman, which got Marcello Fonte the Best Actor Award at Cannes. He's also directed horror and even a family film with a 2019 version of Pinocchio featuring Roberto Benigni. Alice Rohrwacher has gotten recognized at Cannes as well, winning the Grand Prix in only her second feature, The Wonders. Her third feature, Happy as Lazaro, released in 2018 and won the best screenplay at Cannes. Other significant active Italian directors include Gabriele Salvatores, Carlo Verdone, and Marco Bellocchio. Italy has clearly had a massive influence on the world of cinema and will surely continue to be relevant in the decades to come. That's all for this video. Thanks for watching, and please don't forget to subscribe. If there's any other topics you'd like to see a video like this on, please let me know in the comments.